And so I want to start in John chapter 6 because there's a lot of really beautiful things in the 6th chapter of John as context for where this conversation goes. You know, um, John chapter 6 is, is an important passage that we often refer to when we talk about communion, the Eucharist, at least we do. Um, but it's often, we often forget where the chapter begins. In the, in the first verse of John chapter 6, it says, And these things went over, <clears throat> after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them, that were diseased. So he starts with all these people following him from miracles. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, but every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There's a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. What are they among so many? Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Well, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, a number about 5,000. Jesus took the loaves. When he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said to the disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above them that had eaten. After this, he walks on water and is received into the boat, and then everybody's surprised that he's on the other side of the lake. And then this discourse happens that we often appeal to because it ends famously with, eat my flesh and drink my blood. The reason for starting at the beginning here is that I want to build up that context of wh where is everybody in the story coming from. We have all these people who are, who are chasing Jesus around these crowds, and why are they chasing him? Because he's a miracle worker, right? He's, he's healing diseased people. And then, when all these people are here, he's proving his disciples and saying, what, what do you see? How, how can we meet this need? And, he, and the, the, the child among them has the five loaves and the two fishes. And I, I, was, as I was reading this this morning, I can't even imagine what that looked like. Like, how does it look if you're sitting, if you're one of the 12 with Jesus, how does this look like this bread just keeps breaking? And it just, I don't know, I have no idea how that happens, but 5,000 people are fed from this bread that he breaks and this fish. As much as they want and 12 baskets over. And then... And then he commands nature by walking on water and comforting the disciples in the bad weather on the, on the boat. And then he has this discourse with the disciples about bread. To me, that looks like a lot of context to set up a really important discourse that Jesus makes. And I, I want to just read that. I... Um, and I'm reading it for a few reasons. This is, um, when, I, when I've approached this, this series of messages, there's a fine line between reminding us of what we believe and preaching to the choir. I don't want to preach to the choir. I don't want to say things that we all already know and we all already believe, but I do want to remind us of why these things matter. Why is this something at the core of who we are? Why do we find ourselves in having to defend this belief over and over again? You know, there's a lot of people that I talk to that very much like the, the teachings and the things that we're doing, but this is one thing that catches in people's crawl. This is one thing that people say to me, like, hey, I love everything you're doing, but that sacramentalism stuff, it's too far. What are you talking about? It's crazy. I don't believe that. I don't think it's right. And it's a place where we end up defending ourselves again and again and saying, no, here's why we believe this. It's not just about the Eucharist. It's about all these other things. We'll get into that. But I want to look and I want to read this discourse because I love the way that Jesus says it. I love the way that he uses words. Uh, the whole exchange here is just really beautiful to me. So we're going to 
at the at the risk of reading just a large section of scripture, I want to I want to actually invest the time and, and read through what happens here and how Jesus builds his argument that in, that culminates with these hard sayings. So let's jump in. Um, let's jump in at verse. 22. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there, save that one wherein two his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, albeit there came other boats from Tiberias, nigh to the place where they did eat bread, after that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, so we're, we're opening this context with another miracle. Neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? And Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do, that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. They said, Therefore unto him, What sign? Okay, seems like you're kind of missing the point, right? Believe on him and say, well, then give us a sign if you want us to believe on you. That's what they say to him. Um, what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? And then they make this analogy. Our fathers, here's why we believe what we believe, because we saw what God did for our forefathers in the wilderness. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that you also have seen me, and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should rise it up and raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at him, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph? whose father and mother we know. Now, does it sound like, in the context of a miracle-working Jesus, that he's making an aus audacious claim? They, and when he makes his audacious claim, how do they respond? They respond with reason. Who is this guy to tell us that? That doesn't make any sense. We know who this guy is. We know who his family is. We know where he comes from. This is just some guy. Who? What right does he have to call himself the bread of heaven? They respond to his audacious claims by trying to verify with their own minds, with their own reasons, does this make sense? They murmured at him because they said, I'm the bread which came down from heaven. Is not this Jesus the son of Joseph? How is it then that he said, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It's written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. 
Not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give him is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And the Jews therefore strove again amongst themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? For they understand his point, they just don't believe it. They know exactly what he's saying. How can he give us his flesh to eat? They know the claim that he's making. They just don't believe he has the right to make it. And when Jesus knew in himself, uh, no, sorry, back up. Um, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? What verse is that? 52. 52. read. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. And I will raise him up the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him, as the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What if you should see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It's the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. So, so Jesus is making some very audacious claims there. And what often happens in these, in, in when somebody looks at this, is that we say, oh, well, they just didn't understand. They were jumping to conclusions that he didn't intend to make. We can find out. Let's turn to Mark chapter 13, verse 22. I'm going through this exercise, not because we haven't talked about this before, but very much in harmony with what, um, where Seth started us, is that I want to I wanna look at how we approach the scriptures. Mark 13 and verse 22. If we want to know what Jesus was talking about when he makes these claims that they said, how are you going to give your meat, how, how are you going to give your flesh as food to eat, and how are you going to give your blood to drink, then we can jump into these passages. They're in several of the Gospels. In Mark 13, we'll look at this one because it's close, in verse 22. At the Last Supper, he says, but of the day that, and that hour knoweth no man, uh, I'm sorry, I'm 32. 20, uh, For false Christs and false prophets shall rise. And that's 24. But in those days after that tribulation... Mm, what, what, that's not right. No, we're not in the right place. I think the original says 13 two. No, nope, we're looking for the, the Mark passage for the Last Supper. 14, 14 22. We're a chapter off. Yep, here we are. And as they did eat, 14.22, as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup when he had given thanks. He gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine, until this day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now, I've believed in the sacrament of the Eucharist for a long time. And I have developed a complex set of thoughts and ideas and connections between this 
and, and, and many other passages in the Bible. But none of those things are necessary. See, this is the beauty of the simplicity of these core teachers of the church. They're four peasants, they're four poor people, they're four the illiterate. It's, it's, it's not a complicated case to make where Jesus sits in John chapter 6 and argues and disputes with people and says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And then in all these gospel uh, representations of the Last Supper, he says this expression, take, eat, this is my body, take, drink, this is my blood. And, and we'll, we'll fast forward into Corinthians and we'll see where Paul is making the same point and using the same formula again. It's not a complicated message. What, and, and you can think all that you want about how that is or what that means or why that is, but the very simple message of the church, the very simple thing that we embrace is just that Jesus said we should eat his flesh and drink his blood, and then with his disciples, he broke bread and said, this is my flesh, take and eat, this is my blood, drink ye all of it. And you can do whatever you want with that from that point on. You can make that as elaborate or complex or as eschatological or as ethereal as you want it to be. But the fact of the matter is, when we break the bread, we're breaking the body of Christ and we're eating it. When we pass the cup, we're drinking the blood of Christ. This is what he gave us. This is what we do. I don't need any more complexity than that. But there's more to be had if we look. 1 Corinthians, start at 10. Well, let's go to 11 first. You say, Matthew, you're reading too much into that. Why would you focus on that? Why is that the thing that you take away from John 6? Well, look here at what the apostle says. He's rebuking them for their bad communion practices. And then in verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do shew the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Why would you be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord if Paul is not telling us that this is the body and the blood of the Lord? But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. <clears throat> Let's go one step further. Flip back to the 10th chapter. And look in the 16th verse. Starting in verse 14 of chapter 10. Wherefore, my, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion, the common union to be mixed with, the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel, after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices, partakers of the altar? What say I then? That the idol is anything, or that which is offered and sacrificed to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils, and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Why can't you take of the cup of devils and the cup of the Lord? Why can't you take of the table of devils and the table of the Lord? 
So do the thought experiment. I show up and I live next door to the Masonic Lodge and they're having some weird ritual and I walk over to see my friend and they're passing her out, they're doing, they're lighting candles and spanking each other, I don't know what they're doing, being weird and saying incantations and they start passing around a cup. Do you think I'm gonna drink that cup? Well, there's nothing in it, right? I'm a memorialist, so there's nothing, it doesn't matter? Well, why wouldn't you? Man, you don't wanna offend people, you don't wanna be awkward. I don't, I, don't, I don't want fellowship with devils. I'm not going to drink that cup. I'm not going to sit at that table. It's not the place I belong. It's not the fellowship that I want. I don't want to be connected to and tied to and bound to those things. What do I want to be connected to and bound to? I want to be tied to and connected to and bound to the cup of the Lord and the saints that sit at that table. We have all of this, we could, we, we could spend all of our time here, but actually this isn't just a message on the Eucharist. I'm going to talk about sacraments more generally. I just want to make a case with the Eucharist, how we start to think about these things, where we put together our picture of understanding of what are the sacraments, so that begs the question, what are the sacraments? Before I do, you know, the other, the other important case to be made with these things is that, so we have Jesus, we have the apostles, and then we can, we can look throughout the church history, we can see faithful men of God making the case over and over again the same way. So just off the top of your head, you know, you look very early on in the Didache. It says, you gave food and drink to men for enjoyment that they might give thanks to you, but to us you freely gave spiritual food and drink and life eternal through your servant. Ignatius, breaking one and the same bread, which is the medicine of immortality, the antidote to prevent us from dying so that we should live forever in Jesus Christ. Ignatius, again, I desire, this is one of my favorite Ignatius quotes, I desire the bread of God, the heavenly bread, the bread of life, which is the flesh of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and I desire the drink of God, namely his blood, which is incorruptible love and eternal life. And on and on it goes. I don't want to belabor the point, I just want to make it. What's a sacrament? It's been defined different ways by different groups and different people, and maybe it's a clunky word, maybe we could do better, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm open to suggestions, but I, 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 like, I, I like its real meaning. A sacrament is a mystery. And uh, lest anyone's afraid of, of mysteries, I mean, Paul says marriage is a great mystery concerning Christ and the church. We have mysteries, you know. We have mysteries. There are things that make sense to us that don't make sense to those outside of us. There are things that are revealed with spiritual eyes that do not make sense to the carnal man. Let me say that again, because that's an important point. It's an important point of why sacraments matter, which I'll talk about later, but it's an important point that there are things that we believe that do not make sense to the natural man. There are things that are not perceived with your eyes, with the eyes of your flesh. There are things that we know and believe about God that are revealed to us through the scriptures and through the Holy Spirit. This is not just a process of logical deduction. You cannot argue your way into the kingdom. You cannot think your way into the kingdom. You cannot be, pers you cannot be argued into the kingdom. God calls people and his spirit speaks to our spirit. He shows us things and he calls us. He calls us to repent and he makes us new in the waters of baptism. He shows us things that are not revealed unto flesh. And it's important for us, the people of God, to remember from time to time, especially right here at Fathers of the Way in Boston, it's important for us to remember that there are parts of our faith that are not logically deduced and logically derived. There are parts of our faith that come from God that he tells us, and we say, yes, we see, we believe. The resurrection is not a logical premise. And the most important, the dearest, the, the most centered parts of our faith are not the parts that we argue with our minds. They're the parts that are revealed to us by the Spirit and that we accept and believe in faith. 
So back to a sacrament. What's a sacrament? A sacrament, for our purposes today, I'll define this way. A sacrament is a place in space and time that God crams with supernatural grace. Grace meaning his power, especially his power to obey his will. Let's, let's back up for a minute. What I would say is that the things that we call sacraments, that our mysteries, are things that are not just logical deductions, they're the, they're the moments in time. They're physical things. They're things that we discern with our physical senses that have been infused and crammed together with supernatural reality to be more than the sum of their parts. And I start this argument about the sacraments by thinking about who is Christ. How is Christ? How is Christ 100% God and 100% man? It's not, it's, not a, it's not a logical proposition. The homotheus, the God-man, is God and is man. This is the central tenet of who Jesus is. He's all both. And the things that the church calls sacraments are the things that come from him that are like him. When we enter into the waters of baptism, it's a very sense-oriented experience. We, it's cold, it's wet, it chokes out your breath, it, it is all-encompassing. That's the point of baptism. You're all the way under. You're submerged every Nerve feels and knows everything in you knows you're being baptized. It's a very sensory oriented experience, but it's not just sensory. It's not, it's not that sin is something like dirt that you can wash off of your body, but it is in every sense the, the, the washing that washes sin off of our lives. It is both things in one moment in time where God takes something that's physical and natural and makes it something holy and righteous, something that creates an effect supernaturally and spiritually in our lives. That's what the sacraments are. These, <coughs> these principles, these things... These sacraments, they're, they're that category of thing. They're, they're places, they're little, they're, they're miracles. Can I say that? They're miracles. They're places where God is in an intervening in our time, in our space, and making something physical something else. We could do the exact same pattern with baptism that we just did with the Eucharist. We could look at Jesus saying, believe and be baptized and thou shalt be saved. We could look at Acts 2.38 where Peter, after they're pricked in their heart, says be baptized for, why? For the remission of sins. We could look, we could read all the way through Romans chapter 6 right now. We could say, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how should we that are dead to sin live any longer than therein? Know you not that so many of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into what? His death. Something is happening. I'm not just getting wet. I'm not just making a statement about I believe Jesus. God is affecting my baptism to create an effect in my life. He is, he is uniting me with Christ's death. He is, he is judging my sins and my former man. He is creating me anew. He is raising me in the power of the resurrection. And he is joining me to the body of Christ. But Romans 6 teaches us all those things about baptism. And then we can fast forward to Peter where he says, the like figure, he talks about the, being saved by water. Eight souls were saved by water. And the like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Not just washing your body. But the answer of a good conscience towards God. And just like with the Eucharist, these places, these places of the sacraments are the places where God is calling us to that same childlike faith that the, that the young boy with five loaves and two fishes says, I'm giving you whatever I got. I, I take, it, you can make something out of this. And the church is appealing just like that righteous child. And when we come to these things, when we come to baptism, when we come to the Eucharist, when we come to the sacraments, we're just like him. We're saying, you can make something of this. 
And it, it, it's, uh, it's sad to me that so many of our brothers and sisters, so many people who know the scriptures, who love Jesus, can't come to these things and say, I'm willing, to, I'm willing to put it in your hands and let it be what you say it is. You make it something. I just have water, but you can make it cleanliness. I just have bread and wine, but you can make it the body and the blood of Christ. And we can do the same thing, and we can look and see what, what holy men in the church said about baptism and its importance and its value and what it does to people. We can track the same trajectory and vindicate these practices as the pillars of the church that matter very, very much to us and to God. What, what are the sacraments? What are these things? Um, oftentimes, when I have these conversations with people who, it's a new idea to them, they've never heard this before, or they were raised in churches where they don't believe this, I, one kind of like touch point, one easy place to begin is with marriage. Most of the people that I know, most of the people I interact with, it's very easy to get on the same page that when we go to a wedding and we watch two people make vows to each other, and they're consecrated, that, that, that something is happening there that you don't discern with your eyes. You can, it, I think for, for, the, for us, we can perceive it with our hearts, but some, well, all of us believe that when marriage is enacted, something is happening where physically there's two people, but God has done something to make one. God has tied them together in a way that can't be untied, and, and that's a premise of faith. We see it, we know it. I mean, we don't see it, but we know it and we feel it. And we teach it and we believe it. And that's fairly universal. That's a sacrament. You can't, you, you, you have a, a, a prospective bride and a groom and they're standing there in front of the people and they make their commitments to each other and they're pronounced man and wife. Like there's no, you can't, you can go up and put a, you can wave around them and see if there's any strings tied to them, but you can't find that. But you know that God has done something to make these two into one. Why are we willing to grant that? But we can't take the same, the same faith and the same confidence about these other things that are spoken of in the same way. How about anointing? Anointing the sick with oil. I, I'm Italian, so I believe in the benefits of olive oil. I love it. But, I, but I'm, not, I'm not so Italian. I think it heals everything. But anointing with oil is something where God enacts something physical through the faith of his people and creates something supernatural. I think maybe, I'm speaking to myself here now, I think maybe we should do that more too, brothers and sisters. If any is sick among you, let them call for the elders. Confess your faults, and you'll be forgiven. Confess your sins, you'll be forgiven. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Why does this all matter? Why is it important that this is something that we stand on as a group of people? Why is, it, why is it important for us to continue to teach and believe and, and, and show people that, this is, that these things are true? There's a few reasons, and maybe you come up with some more, but the things that occur to me this afternoon, the, the why it matters, is that... <clears throat> It matters primarily because of how we approach the scriptures. I want to be able to, where, where we can say, the scriptures say this and this and this and this. I want us to be able to say, amen. I don't have to, I just can say, I agree with that. And it's a problem that a lot of us came to. Uh, for me, I've heard the testimony of other people. 
when I was when I was in the evangelical world and I was reading the scriptures and I was trying to understand what was happening and I was hearing the arguments of this and that, I finally got to the place where I said, I just want to be able to say what the Bible says. I just want to be able to tell people, be baptized for the mission of sins. I just want to be able to tell people, like Ananias said to Saul, arise. What are you waiting for? Arise. And be baptized and wash away your sins. I want to be able to say, baptism also now saves us. Not because we get our bodies wet, but because that's how we find a clear conscience with God. I just want to say amen to that stuff. I just want to be able to say, Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall not see the kingdom of heaven. And then he broke bread and said, take, eat, this is my body. Take, drink, this is my blood. I just want to say amen. I want that too. I want to do what they were doing. I want to be what they were. I want to, I want to experience what they experienced with him. I don't want to understand. I don't want to try to figure out what's supernatural, what's psychological about prayer. I don't want to know. I don't want to have to understand why. Why our sisters covering their heads is authority? It speaks to authority. I I don't know. I don't. I don't always know the answer to these questions, but I know what the scriptures say. And that's enough. And here's the beautiful thing. Here's the beautiful thing for every one of us who love and follow Christ. If we follow his words, if we do what he says, if we're faithful to what we're called to do, if we can embrace the scriptures and walk in them, we can live lives that if we knew everything God knows, we wouldn't have done anything different. That's what he offers us. That's the abundant life. It's why we are still washing each other's feet. You know, I hear people all the time, oh, it's so silly. You don't understand what he's really saying. If you would just, what, me, what he told us about washing feet, if you just like, it, he's trying to, te- you're missing the point. He's trying to teach us to serve each other. He's trying to teach us all these things. Okay, yeah, that's true. But he also said, happier are you if you do these things. And it just so happens, every time I've done it, it makes me happy. <laughs> I think I'll just take him at what he said. I don't want to not serve my brothers and sisters, but I also just want to do what he said. And that scriptural approach, that little child with his five loaves and his two fishes saying, you can make something of this. That's how I want us to be as a people. Another reason it matters is that there's lessons learned from these truths. There's things that you gain as you start to walk in these things, as you start to experience the depth and the breadth and the beauty and the holiness that comes through experiencing the sacraments in your life. You start to discern things and see things about the world around you that become really, really beautiful and deeply treasured. This dear brother, my new friend Daniel, he came up here and he saw us and he said, because he's heard, do you guys ever get tired of the sacraments? Do you ever get bored? Does it ever become commonplace? Does it ever get tired? No. No. A thousand times no. It has never been boring. It is, I've never gotten tired of it. I've never had a Sunday where I'm not eager to come and break bread with the disciples and experience Christ in our midst. Every single Sunday, it fills my heart with joy. It's the center of my world. It's everything I want. I've told people, you know, when we talk when we talk about Christmas and stuff, and they're like, "What's wrong with celebrating Jesus being incarnate?" I said, "Nothing. We do it every single week. Every week we celebrate the incarnation of Jesus. He's manifest." In the elements of the Eucharist, we get to experience him right here, right now, with us as a people. He, he inhabits our elements. He becomes a part of us and who we are and what we're doing every single week. And those are truths that I discern from walking in these graces. It's important for us because it's the way we lead new disciples. It's the way we teach people that come to the church. And if, if I was a memorialist, I would have a lot more sympathy. Like, if baptism just means I'm, I'm telling people with a, some kind of public expression that I want to follow Jesus, then 
you know, the details don't matter all that much. You do it at 10, do it at 7, do it at 12, do it at 15, do it before you repent, do it after you repent. What does it matter? Just trying to say to people that you want to follow Jesus. And that's how it functions in most people's lives, many people's lives. But if God is doing something there, if there's, if there's something that's happening from God in our souls, in our spirits, that's combining with our faith to make something real that washes our sins away, now it matters a whole lot how we enter into that water. It matters a whole lot who comes there and how. If I don't believe that the, the cup is his blood and the bread is his body, what stops people? I mean, how do I take Paul seriously when he says you're guilty of the body and the blood of Christ? There's something that weighs me and it settles me and it sobers me when I come to the, to the Lord's table that I'm, this isn't a trifle. It's not a little thing. It's not unimportant. It's how he's moving in us and to us and through us to make us who he wants us to be. It's creating what he wants us to be. It's a part of what creates what he wants us to be. It matters because a sacramental view has an expectation of faith. Another, another common issue that is raised when I talk about sacramentalism is that somehow it's works. Well, you believe that you can do the work of baptism and that produces salvation. You can do the work of a, a Eucharistic meal and that, that somehow sanctifies you. It's absolutely opposite. I can't, I can't make people's sins go away with water. What, what am I going to do with water? I can't do anything with water. But God can. And that's the difference. This is, this is literally the opposite of a work. It's appealing to something that only God can do. Flesh cannot turn water to remove sins. Flesh cannot make bread into the body of Christ. Flesh cannot turn wine into the blood of Christ. Flesh cannot use, make oil heal sicknesses. Flesh cannot do these things. It's exactly the opposite of a work. It's an appeal to God to work. It's an appeal to God's work in our lives. And it requires our faith. The water is water still until we repent and enter into it in faith. You can go in it. You can pronounce whatever words you want over it. You can do whatever ceremonies you want over it. You can do a dance. You can do whatever you want. That water can only affect your sins when entered by faith and repentance. One last reason I want to mention that it matters is something I mentioned already. We are not materialists. We're people of faith. We're people who believe God. And we believe that he's more than what we can do. So we believe that he's more than what our minds can think. We believe that he's more than what our senses can sense. We are not materialists. We believe in the supernatural. We believe that God is at work in our lives and in our history. He's at work in our church. He's at work in our prayers. He's at work in our sacraments. He is here and present. That's why these things matter. Why don't we pray together? <clears throat> Holy Father in heaven, we worship you together. We are in awe of your ways. We're in awe of the beauty of Christ 
And we are so grateful and humbled to be able to take part in your way of operating in our lives. We are so grateful for these beautiful, holy, precious jewels in the church. The things that come through Christ and his authority. The, the power and the opportunity to baptize believers into Christ. And to be for each of us to be raised in the power of the resurrection. The opportunity to, to take part in the same thing that the apostles did that night with him in the upper room. That ever since then he's been fasting in anticipation of the kingdom. And we've been showing his death as a reminder again and again. And taking part again and again, your people throughout the ages faithfully representing Christ, faithfully partaking of his body and his blood, faithfully being changed, altered, and growing thereby. We pray, Father, that you would sanctify us through those things, through all these things, and help us to remain faithful to these gifts that you've given your church. Father, together we want to appeal to you like that righteous child with his loaves and fishes, we come to you, Father, expecting that we don't know how these things can work, but we know that you can work. And we trust you in them. We trust you with our souls. We trust you with our future and our faith. We worship you together in Jesus' name.